I'd like to say thank you to Adam and Jessica and the band uh, for, for leading, particularly Adam and Jessica as they have taken up the, the, the organization of the worship planning for this service. And thank you guys for all your work. Really, really appreciate it. Chuck Swindoll, in his book, David, A Man of Passion and Destiny, uh, shares this story from the year 1809. How many of you uh, remember 1809? Anybody? <laughs> um, he says this, the year 1809 was a very good year. Of, co of course, those who were alive that year didn't know it. He says he, um, he goes on to talk about that most of the world was focused on Napoleon that year. He was marching across Austria, uh, planning to take over the world. And many people were afraid of that and thinking about that. But Swindoll says in that same year, thousands of babies were born in Britain and America. He says no one cared about those babies. But look at the list. William Gladstone was born in England, along with Alfred Lloyd Tennyson. Oliver Wendell Holmes was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts, a few miles away. Edgar Allan Poe was born. In a little log cabin in Hardin, Kentucky, an illiterate laborer and his wife named their newborn son Abraham Lincoln, all in the year 1809. Now I bet this morning not one of you could name a battle that Napoleon was fighting in Austria in 1809, but all of you and all of us have been impacted by the lives of these babies born in 1809. This morning, as we come to this part of the story of David, this is what's happening. The whole world is focused on Saul and what's going on in Israel. And in a sheep pasture just outside of Bethlehem, we have a little boy who's preparing to be king. As you might remember from last week, um, we want to talk about the whole dynamic of the story. And if you weren't here last week, I would encourage you to go and listen to the sermon last week. It'll help you, I think, kind of get up to speed with the story. But you might remember we are in this period of time when the nation of Israel had their first king and it didn't work out so well. Well, actually, he's still the king. But he has been rejected by God. And if you back up, as what we did last week, if you back up a little bit further, you might remember that God said, I'm going to be your king. And the people said, no, we'd really rather have our own king. He said, okay, here's the king. And Saul was called by, or was anointed by the prophet to be king. But then occasion after occasion, Saul kind of messes up. And finally, this whole ordeal where God tells him to go and slaughter, or take out this whole um, area, this whole nation. And Saul does it in a half-hearted sort of way. And then Samuel comes to God and says, you didn't do what God told you to do. And Saul said, yeah, I did. Kind of. <laughs> and... He makes excuses and says, you know, well, I was going to give it to God as an offering, as a sacrifice. And, and Samuel says, well, Saul, what you need to know is that the Lord has rejected you as king. The Lord is going to find someone after his own heart. So this is the context that we have here in this place. We come here to 1 Samuel chapter 15. We read here, until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again. So Samuel mourned for him, and the Lord was grieved that he had made Saul king over Israel. It's a sad day. Samuel is mourning. God is grieving. Now this is interesting, isn't it? I mean, to, to imagine God grieving. That's sometimes hard for us to, to wrap our minds around, isn't it? Look at the ESV translation of this verse. The ESV actually says, The Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. God regretting something? That seems kind of strange, doesn't it? Well, how do we make sense of this? This Hebrew word here for grieve or regret, it's used in one other place in Scripture. It's used in the story of Noah. Do you remember that? We actually read in Genesis 6, the Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. So the same kind of dynamic that God had with man just before Noah, he has with Saul now as king. Now, this word has a variety of meanings. On the one hand, it can mean regret. I wish I wouldn't have done that, right? But on the other hand, it can mean just simply feeling sorrow. And that, I think that's the appropriate translation here. I don't think that God made a mistake. 
I don't think that God said, ah, I shouldn't have done that. You see, we also read in 1 Samuel chapter 15, He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he's not a man that he should change his mind. So it's not that God changed his mind. It's not that God messed up. It's not that God said, ah, really screw this one up. It didn't, didn't work out like that. It's simply saying God is sorrowful about what's happened here. And the prophet of God is in sorrow. Almost depression as we're going to find out in just a few minutes here. So I think the best way to understand this is that God is sorrowful and we can certainly see this text today as a low point in Israel's history. But God isn't finished. God has a plan and that's where we're going to go this morning. But before we do that, I'm going to ask David to come. Or as we do that, I'm going to ask David Rodriguez to come and read. I'm going to ask you to open in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 15. He's going to be reading 1 Samuel 15 verse 34 through chapter 16 verse 13. And let me invite you to leave your Bibles open because we're going to come back to this and we're going to study this together this morning. So go ahead, David. All right. Then Samuel left for Ramah, but Saul went up to his home in Gibeah of Saul. Until the day Samuel died, he did not go see Saul again, though Samuel mourned for him. And the Lord was grieved that he had made Saul king over Israel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? Saul will hear about it and kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the, what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, Do you come in peace? Samuel replied, Yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord anointed stands before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by. But Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered, but he is tending the sheep. Samuel said, Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent and had him brought in. He was ruddy, with fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. He is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Samuel then went to Ramah. All right. Thank you, David. Now, we open the text this morning together, and the first thing that you might notice here, and, and I love this text, by the way. This is one of my favorite stories. And as we get into this, and as I, as I was studying this, preparing for this sermon, there's some things that I saw in this text that I had not seen before, or I had not remembered before, at least. And the first one is this, that Samuel was stuck. Do you notice that? We kind of blaze over that sometimes, and we get to the part about the boys coming in and, and not, not choosing the one that we think he's... We often skip over this first part of the text. But Samuel is stuck in disappointment here. Samuel's still thinking about Saul. Do you notice that in the text? The people of God had selected Saul as their king. And Saul is still the king, okay? Don't forget that. Because Saul is still reigning. And he's going to be reigning for quite some time here. And, but God's hand is no longer on Saul. God has withdrawn his hand from Saul. And God is doing something new. And Samuel is a little upset about this. He's a little sad that it didn't work out. In fact, he's a lot sad. He's mourning. He's grieving. And, and you think about this for a minute. In that day and time, the nation was very vulnerable, right? I mean, it could be, you could be living life and everything be going well one day, and the next day you could be a slave because your, your, your team, your country, lost in war, right? And all of a sudden you're deported off in slavery. That's just how it worked in that day and time. 
And the country's leader no longer has the hand of God on him. And Samuel's upset about this. He knows that Israel is not in a good place right now. Look what it says. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul? Since I have rejected him as king over Israel. Don't you like when God asks questions? God tends to ask a lot of questions, doesn't he? And if you look in the, the Gospels, count the number of times, if you will, when Jesus asks a question. He does that, doesn't he? Because it helps us kind of look inside of us, our, ourselves. And here's what God, God comes to Samuel and says, How long are you going to stay at the pity party? How long are you going to mourn? How long are you going to keep thinking about what has been? Okay? And maybe you're reading this this morning, and that's where you are. God's saying to you, how long are you going to stay right where you are? How long are you going to keep focusing on the past? How long are you going to live in the failure, in the disappointment, whatever it is that's happened? You know, many times we have a tendency, like Samuel, to get stuck there. And that's what's going on. But God comes to Samuel and he prompts him to action. Look at verse 1 here. This is chapter 16, verse 1. Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I've chosen one of his sons to be king. I've got a plan, Samuel. You're in your disappointment. You're stuck in this place of, of failure. But I'm coming to you and I'm saying, I've got a plan. And I want you to get your bags packed. I want you to get your, your horn ready. I want you to put some oil in it. I want you to get ready because I'm going to send you on a journey. And you are to go to Bethlehem. God is inviting Samuel here to join him on his mission. Do you notice that? Samuel, come with me. We've got work to do. And notice that he only gives him one step. He doesn't tell him the whole story, does he? Simply get your bags packed. We're going to anoint a king. God, notice also that God says in verse 1, a king I have chosen. Okay? <laughs> it didn't work out too well when the people chose their king, did it? But now God is choosing the king and God is choosing a man after his own heart. Now, you would think that Samuel would be excited at this point, right? I mean, wouldn't you be? You're kind of down in the dumps. You're not sure how it's going to work out. The, the, the whole king thing has not worked out already. You've been mourning for some time. We're not sure how long. God comes and says, how long are you going to stay there? I've got a plan. Get your stuff packed. We're going to go. You think Samuel would just get up and say, all right, it's time to go. It's time to join God on his mission. God's going to do something great here, and I'm going to be a part of it. But that's not at all how he responds, does he? Look how he responds in verse 2. But, that's a key word there. But. But Samuel said, how can I go? Saul will hear about it and kill me. Samuel is not at all excited about this trip. He's not at all eager to join God on his mission. In fact, he's fearful. He's uncertain. He's looking at the risk and the hazards involved here. Now remember, Saul is still king, right? And we know that Saul is a crazy man. Okay? Later we're going to see Saul throwing his spear at David. We're going to see Saul later going into this town that's full of priests and absolutely slaughtering all of the priests. Okay, Saul's not afraid to kill men of God. And Samuel knows it. Saul's not afraid to kill a prophet. He'll do it. And Samuel knows it. And if, if Saul has been rejected as king and Samuel's going around anointing other people as king, Saul's not going to like it very much. Right? And Samuel knows it. And Samuel's focused on this. Samuel is living in a place of fear. Now before we give Samuel a hard time here, we have to understand that Samuel's response here is not at all unlike other heroes of the faith. Right? You remember Moses? God came to Moses and says, Moses, I got a job for you. I want you to go to Pharaoh and I want you to tell him to let my people go. And Moses says, I can't do it, God. You got the wrong guy. I can't even talk. I have, I have a speech impediment or whatever's going on. You know, and over and over again we see this in scripture. God comes to people and says, would you join me on my mission? And often we say, I don't know God. It's kind of scary. I don't know God. There's a lot of risk involved. I don't know if I can join you. That's what Samuel is doing here. 
Now, notice here, if you're reading the text here, and you see God asks Samuel a question, how long? It's kind of a rhetorical question, right? He doesn't really ask Samuel, expect Samuel to answer that question, right? And, and then he says, Samuel, I want you to go. And Samuel says, I don't know, God, I don't think I can do it. God doesn't even respond. Do you notice that? He doesn't even respond to him. He just gives him more instructions here in verse 2. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. God just simply gives more instructions here. Here's the GPS coordinate, Samuel. Plug it in your GPS. Get in there and go, okay? I'll tell you what to do next. Just go take your stuff, go to Bethlehem, and I'll give you the instructions. Again, what's Samuel going to do? I mean, too often we skip over this part of the story, but, but live in the tension for just a moment of this place. Here's the prophet of God. He has a choice. Is he going to join God on his mission? Or is he going to remain in isolation, in fear, worried about the circumstances surrounding him? Now, from a human perspective, Samuel has every reason to be afraid. He has every reason to be worried. So what's he going to do? The risk involved? Certainly the risk involved. But what is he going to do? Is he going to live in fear? Is he going to live focused on Saul and the circumstances surrounding him? Or is he going to join God on his mission? And you and I, in many times, we have that same choice, don't we? What are we going to think about? What are we going to focus on? Are we going to look at the risk involved? Are we going to look at things kind of from a worldly perspective? Or are we going to simply follow God, even if there are risks involved, and go where he calls us to go? Samuel has a choice to make. And in the next sentence, just a few words here, but these words are profound. Look at verse 4. Samuel did what the Lord said. Pretty simple, isn't it? And if we're reading the story, you and I are going, yes, he did, right? He jumped in. He's with God. He's going to go against the fear. He's going to trust that God will take care of him, even though there's a crazy king ready to kill him. He's going to do it anyway. Samuel made the right choice, and so he goes to Bethlehem. And when he arrives in Bethlehem, what does he find? He finds a people living in fear. Fear's all over the place here, isn't it? Samuel's fearful, and now the people in Bethlehem are, are fearful. Now, I don't know about you, but when you think of a prophet, a lot of times, you think of like this old man with a long beard, kind of like Larry's used to look last week, or a few weeks ago. <laughs> but you kind of think of him as old, kind of barely walking around. But that's not at all what Samuel is. Samuel is a tough dude, let me tell you. In fact, when Saul refused to kill Agag, guess who goes and kills Agag? Samuel does, right? So Samuel isn't just some weak, feeble old man. He's a tough guy. And he's a prophet from God. Okay? And so he has the power of God or the voice of God. So when he shows up in town, people are like, whoa, there's the prophet of God. What's he going to do? Is he going to call down fire from heaven on us? Or what's he going to do? So they're living in fear. And so when he arrives, verse 4, at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel said, yes, I've, yes, in peace. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Now, there's, there's some sort of liturgical washing that they would have done to prepare themselves for the sacrifice. We don't know exactly what this looked like or what all it involved, but it took some time. And so Jesse and his sons are preparing for the sacrifice to hear the voice of the Lord. Now I want to point out, and again, I want to live kind of in the tension of this moment. Samuel does not know what God is going to say at this point, okay? Jesse does not know what God is going to say. His sons do not know what God is going to say. They are simply living in a posture of listening. They're preparing themselves. They're cleansing themselves. They're all in this posture of, a, okay God, what do you want? We're ready to listen. And then we come to verse 6 here. We get some insight of what's going on in Samuel's mind. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands before the Lord. 
Now, Samuel knows, because we read earlier, that God is going to anoint a king. And, and you know, he's got to be thinking. He's human, right? He's got to be thinking, which one is it? And as soon as he looks up and sees the boys come in, he's, his eye is, he gravitates toward Eliab. Eliab's the oldest. He probably had the older child syndrome, right? Probably the leader. He's tall. He's handsome. He's a warrior. And I bet Samuel's going, there he is. That's a new king right there. Just waiting on God to, to let me know. That's him, right? But Samuel's going to learn something here. And we're going to learn something as we read the story together. You see, Eliab is a man of battle. We know that. We see him in the next chapter. But we also know from chapter 17 that Eliab is critical and negative, okay? His heart is not in the right place. And, and while on the outside, he's got all the stuff that he looks like a king. On the inside, his heart is not in line with God's heart. And that's what we know. And, and I think this next part of the text here gives us some insight into what Samuel is thinking. And, and it really helps us in, in our thinking too. Look what God tells him here in verse 7. The Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Isn't that powerful? Keep reading in verse 8. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. So Benadab is Jesse's second oldest son. He probably looked a lot like his brother. Maybe just a younger version, right? And, and Jesse goes, well, maybe not him. It's going to be the second one for sure, right? The second one passes and it's not him either. Maybe number three comes forward. Verse 9. Jesse then had Shema pass by. But Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Not him either. The author doesn't give us every detail. He doesn't, doesn't march every one in front of Samuel. But we know that everyone does march in front. Look at verse 10. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. Every single one comes before Samuel. And, and you know, I don't know how it worked out. I don't know where they were standing. I'm not sure what they looked like. But you could imagine with each son that passed by... And Samuel said, nope, it's not him. Maybe Jesse's heart sunk a little bit. Maybe Samuel's heart sunk a little bit. And you get down to the last one and you're thinking number seven's coming by. And he's not the one either. And Samuel's looking out the door. Where's the next one? I, I came here to anoint a king. And there's no king. Maybe I've got the wrong address. You think? He's thinking that? <laughs> Maybe you're the wrong Jesse. Is there another Jesse that lives in Bethlehem? Did I get it mixed up? What's going on here? And he says to Jesse, are there any more? Are these all the sons that you have? Now we're reading the story here. We're reminded that God is looking not at the outward appearance, but he's looking at the heart. Okay, this is hard for us, isn't it? Because all we see is outward appearances. And many of us are still, we're captive with outward appearances, right? And Samuel is thinking about outward appearances. Jesse is thinking about outward appearances. And all seven sons have come by, and it's not the king. Look what Jesse says in verse 11. There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. But he's tending the sheep. Now, why is David tending sheep? Why did Jesse not bring him to the sacrifice? Uh, you know, maybe you could probably make the case that somebody had to watch a sheep, right? So Jesse just picked the one that would be least likely to be king and sent him out in the sheep field. For whatever reason, David's out watching the sheep. And, and, and can you imagine this conversation here? Samuel says, any more children? Any more sons? Jesse says, yeah, there's one. He's out in the sheep field, but he's more the shepherd kind of guy and not really a king sort of person, right? Can you imagine that conversation? Because he had to be a little embarrassed that he didn't bring him, right? And, and Jesse's kind of saying, ah, you know, just not the kind of person you would think would ever be king. And look at the next verse here. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. 
I love that verse because there's urgency here, isn't there? The, the, can you imagine Jesse's a little nervous, right? Samuel's a little nervous because he's come here. He's come to anoint a king. All the sons have come by. And, and now they've got to go all the way out to the sheep field and, and get another one and bring him in. And, and, and I imagine them just kind of pacing the floor here, right? What's going to happen? Is he the one? I don't know. Jesse's thinking Samuel's here. He's a prophet. He, he's kind of scary guy. And, and what's he going to do if David's not the one? And, and so they don't even sit down, okay? You know, how often are we like that in our relationship with God? How often are we at a place where we're so eager to hear the voice of God that we won't even sit down? We won't even rest. We're just waiting for, God, would you tell me what to do? That's what's going on here. So, so let's live in the tension of this for just a moment. So he sent and had him brought in. He was ruddy with a fine appearance and handsome features. Now, the word ruddy there, what, what does that mean? How many of you use that word this week, right? <laughs> it literally means red or reddish. The only other time in scripture that we see it is a description of Esau being born. If you go back to Genesis chapter 25, you read, The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. Now, David's not hairy, okay, but he is red-ish. Maybe he had red hair. Maybe his skin just has kind of a reddish tone to it. Most people in the Middle East have kind of an olive tone to their skin, right? So David's maybe a little reddish. We're not sure. He's also described as having a fine appearance here. And the, the Hebrew word for fine appearance also can be translated as beautiful eyes. So just picture with me a reddish kid with maybe really nice eyes. And he walks in. And you know, it really doesn't matter what he looks like, right? Because we've already read that, that God's not looking at the outward appearance. But he does give us some information about what he looks like. He walks in, and what does Samuel say? Verse 12. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. He is the one. Samuel does exactly what God tells him to do. Verse 13. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Samuel then went to Ramah. Don't you love that story? Isn't that the coolest story? I, I mean, it's the kind of story that I don't know about you, but it pulls me in. It puts me in a place where, where, where many times we're kind of searching for what God's doing and what God's going to do. And we're wondering what he's going to do. And many times we think we've got it figured out already. You know, we see all these obvious choices. Well, it's going to be that or it's going to be that or God's going to do this. And then God doesn't do it like we think he's going to do it, right? God surprises us. And that's what goes on there. Now, this is a side note. This is not in my notes. But I'm just thinking about this. You may be wondering, why did God anoint David as a little kid? Why, why did he come to him so young and put oil on his head? In front of all of his brothers, right? You know that's going to cause problems, right? Because <laughs> they're going to see him anointed as king. He's going to know that he is anointed as king. I think that God does it as a test for David. Because David will have an opportunities to kind of brag about this, right? To be prideful about this. To say, hey, I'm going to be the king. But David doesn't bite. He doesn't do that. David lives in humility. And I'm getting ahead of myself in the story here. But David lives in humility over and over again. And in the years ahead when he's going to not be the king. But he's going to be anointed as the king. You know, sometimes, sometimes we understand that God's calling us into something. But God, but there's many years between that calling and when it actually happens. And sometimes we're in that period of waiting. And, and I'm just getting way ahead of myself in the story here. I'm excited about this, this story. It's going to be fun to walk through it together. But let's stop the story here today. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, the book by Chuck Swindoll, David, a man of passion and destiny, uh, is a book that's helped me a whole lot in this series. I've been mapping out this series. I'm using it to help organize the stories together and figure out kind of a, a, a way to work through this together. But in his second chapter, Swindoll gives three applications to this part of the story. And I want to use these this morning and show these to you this morning because I think they apply to, to us today. As we are seeking God, as we're looking for God's direction. I want to put these three on the screen here. The first one is this. 
God's solutions are often strange and simple. So be open. God often just calls us to take one step at a time, doesn't he? And if you go back and you look here, all God's telling Samuel to do is, look, get your horn ready, travel to Bethlehem, and wait. You know, so often we have to make it too complicated. We, we think, oh, I've got to figure it all out, and I've got to see how this is going to work, how that's going to work. And so often is the case, God simply says, I want you to do this. And we are obedient to that. And we make one step. We don't know what's going to happen next. But we take that one step and God moves and God acts. And, and, and so often the ways that God wants us to move are often strange too. Not, not something we would expect. This kind of came out of left field. We didn't see this coming. What are we going to do now? How's this going to work out? And so we are called to be open, I think Swindoll is saying here, to whatever it is God wants us to do. So often we try to figure out our own master plan. We try to plan it all out. This is what it's going to look like. This is how it's going to work out. But God says, no, no, no. Don't, don't put that in cement, okay? Because I might have a different plan for you. And, and you need to be open to that. The second application that Swindoll says is this. God's promotions are usually sudden and surprising. So be ready. <laughs> I love that. How many of you... You can say there was a time when God absolutely surprised you with something. You, you weren't expecting it. You didn't see it coming. You, you know, that's how God tends to move, doesn't he? He surprises us. And, and many times we, we're expecting one thing and we get something completely different. Many times we're walking down the road. We, we've got our plan. We know how it's going to work out. And then God brings something new and different. So be ready. Be ready for it. In fact, God, God most of the time works in this way. It's been my experience. He surprises us. Finally, he says this. God's selections are always sovereign and sure. So be sensitive. You know, we can't do this on our own. We can't say, well, you know, God, that's a nice plan, but... I really think this is the way I want to go. And I'm going to go this way, God. And I want your blessing on my life as I walk this way. It doesn't work that way, does it? God has a plan. It's a sovereign plan. It's a sure plan. And we are better off if we will simply join him in it, right? Not try to make our own way. And many times we try to make our own way and we end up right back where God wants us to be, don't we? Some of you could probably tell stories this morning about that. You know, this is such a great text. And we could probably open up the microphone and be here till 3 o'clock this afternoon if we wanted to. Just to hear the stories of you all to say, say, this is what I was doing and God moved this way and this is what happened. It's a challenge to you and me this morning. You know, it's so interesting too that this text hit today because on Tuesday night the church coordination team will meet to begin the discernment process around church staffing. No accident, I don't think. <laughs> We're going to discern together as a congregation. You know, so often um, churches just simply just move. We're on autopilot, right? An associate pastor leaves, or we just hire a new associate pastor and just move on. No, we can't do that. We've got to say, God, what do you want? This is a time for us to stop and discern. Just like Samuel. Stop and discern. Listen to God. We, we need to live in that posture of listening for a little while. Maybe God does want us to hire a new associate pastor. Maybe he doesn't. Maybe he has a different plan. Maybe he has a surprise for us that we have not discovered yet. We need to, we need to stop and discern. That's, that's what we're going to do. It's going to take several months to do this. And we're going to walk through this together as a congregation. So this text not only applies to your life and my life, it also applies to us as a congregation this morning as we discern the Spirit of God among us. As the band comes this morning, I'm not sure what God would be saying to you, but we want to give you a chance to respond. And then we're going to come back to the table together in just a minute here. But if God is speaking to you this morning, if you'd like to come and pray at the altar, it is open. If there's a decision that you'd like to make, perhaps you'd like to join this church or step forward to be baptized, now would be the time that you would come and do this. So let's all stand together and sing.